Now, Christianity from the earliest days, we're talking about the second century on. This is the view of Christianity from the second century on to the 17th century. It's called parallel revelation. As you all know, the great game started with Moses. And following him were the prophets. <clears throat> all the way down, and you can put in some great figures, including Philo the Jew, or Philo of Alexandria, whichever name you like to call him by. Then <clears throat> uh, Jesus, right? Uh, Paul. His companion, of course, was Dionysius. And there was Origen and Tertullian, and the list goes on. Oh, by the way, this is revelation based upon faith, belief. Now, from the 2nd to the 17th century, it was believed that parallel to this at the same time was Hermes Trismegetius. Pythagoras. And a whole line of Greek thinkers, until you get to the more familiar names of uh, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and we can go on, get other names, Pausanias, um, not yeah, well, it's Pisanius. But um, Cyrenius, um, <coughs> Plotinus, just to hit a couple of high ones. Um, Porphyry, Iamblichus, um, Proclus. In any case, parallel. This was called partial revelation. Because it was based upon reason. And that can explain why it is, and why it was, that so many of the teachings on this side could be anticipated over here, because it was a parallel revelation. One by reason, one by faith. Only this was argued to be far more complete, this was partial. Now what's interesting about this as an example, in the uh, days that followed in the mid 10th, 12th, 14th, 16th, 15th, 16th centuries, they argued even further that these people not only <clears throat> had a more fuller revelation, but they actually anticipated the philosophical tradition of the Greeks. Anticipated it. Had it before in a simplified but full form. And therefore, not only did they have a complete one, but on this side, they would say the Greeks had to struggle and work hard on reason and contemplation and use of the intellect to develop this, but it was only in principle partial and it wasn't full and complete as this is. Oh, by the way, a guy by the name of uh, Isaiah, Isaac, Casabando, a Frenchman in the late 17th century, made a nice study and he said, by the way, this is uh, <clears throat> in principle wrong. Uh, these people, uh, Moses at 1200 to 1400 BC, and Trismegidius looks like he's only at the most, the earliest you can get him is 100 BC and most likely 100 AD, and therefore it's not parallel. Well, that had, this created quite a blow. This created quite a blow to this theory. Because you see, at this point, you could teach both systems. Well, let's move on to another piece of history. This name, 
Dionysius is honored. Because he was said to have been the companion of St. Paul, he wrote uh, several works, but among them are some great things called the Great Ten Letters, which is what we're going to talk about. One of the letters, the seventh, you see, describes being, being present, his being present at the crucifixion. And during the crucifixion, of course, there was a, an eclipse, and he describes it, and therefore he is kind of an eyewitness testimony, gives an eyewitness testimony to the crucifixion of Jesus. Very important figure. Now, in these letters and in his writings, I'd like to just read you an assessment of him by a very fine history of philosophy historian, Briere, a Frenchman, who did several volumes of very fine work on the classic age all the way up to the modern age. So I'm quoting now from the Hellenistic and Roman age. Uh, it's interesting, you can get it in paperback now. And I'm on uh, 247, all right, so I'll read a paragraph. Now this is Briere's assessment of the contribution of Dionysius. His writings fall into two classes, the celestial hierarchy and the ecclesiastical hierarchy, which study the complete series of creatures capable of receiving divine revelation from the highest to the lowest. I'm skipping. The second includes divine names and mystical theology. The writings of Dionysius constitute a complete course in theology. Okay. That's the basis of Christian theology. He's the father of it all. Now, there's a very famous article on Dionysius by a chap by the name of Vanesti, V-A-N-N-E-S-T-E. And I'm going to again read something for you. He wants to talk about the uh, effect of this man's writings on the history of Christian thought. Um, Dionysius' works are like a catalyst, both in theology and mysticism. Without them, the mystical life of the West would probably not have taken such a high intellectual turn. Their profound influence was on St. Thomas, and he talks about that. In St. Thomas Aquinas' works, there were three basic influences. He built the whole system on three, three works. And Albert the Great before him. Thomas used the Bible, of course, Aristotle, and Dionysius. He used them to such an extent that he quoted him in his writing 1,700 times. I would say that's owing quite a bit to an author. Albert the Great quotes him in his writings 1,100 times. His thought is so well structured and is the foundation of Christian metaphysics that they can easily use it and then build an entire system upon its foundations. Now, a chap by the name of Lorenzo Valla who, if anyone ever can influence any movie production to make a film, I would say that's the only man worthy of making a film of in the entire Western European tradition. 
He's more significant than any other person that I know of. I'll give you the reasons why I think that's true. Number one. He looked at the writings of Dionysius and he said, I can demonstrate that they could not have been written before 830 AD. The whole thing is a forgery. did that in the late 15th century. Um, interesting enough, the probable date for it is uh, 530 AD. Now, a lot of authorities disagree about this date, and it goes up and down depending upon who you read, but most will accept somewhere between 530, 532, but not, not later. Some go earlier. Now, that's a very interesting day. You see, this entire system started with, formally with Plato, and he started his academy in Athens at 400 BC. It went on continuously, uninterrupted, until 529, when the Christian emperor Justinian said, look here, we cannot allow these philosophers to, to perpetuate their teaching. From this point on, there will be no public teaching of philosophy anywhere in the kingdom. And therefore, he closed down the schools where philosophy was part of a public instruction. The aristocrats could study it independently, but no public instruction of Platonic or pagan philosophy was allowed from this point on into Europe, and that brought on the Dark Ages. The people in the academy at that time, because King Croesus of Syria intervened and said, we'll take them. And so the last remaining philosophers in Europe, Platonic philosophers, left Athens and they moved to Syria. Started many interesting things in Syria, which later became a center, by the way, for Islamic thought, and they continued the Platonic tradition there. It also went to Baghdad in the 10th century until the White Huns came down and destroyed it. Then it went and moved into uh, Islamic thought again and moved into Islamic Spain where it flourished and then it was brought partially into Europe in the uh, 12th century, 11th century, 12th century, 13th century in a series of translations. Now look here. I am not interested in dates because of dating. But would you find it curious that they found these texts, Dionysius's text, in Syria at 530? Oh, <laughs> Suppose it turns out that the metaphysics of Dionysius is nothing other than this entire system of Platonic thought introduced into Christianity by various little subtle devices, changing of language here and there, Instead of calling intellect, pardon me, instead of calling this intelligence, vitality, and being, the realm of the angels. Same dynamics. Instead of talking about the good, God. But he talks about him in such an interesting way. He defines God, Dionysius defines God as the good. He says, God, comma, the good, whenever he, most often when he uses it. In his writings, especially in the letters, he brings in all of the basic principles we've been talking here. He brings them in in a very fine and, and wonderful way because the arguments Dionysius uses turns out to have a one-to-one -one correspondence with Proclus. Proclus was 470 A.D. Now, why would he do that? What's going on? And what sense can we make of it? Now, look here. This is rather curious, is it not? Let me offer a couple of suggestions. But before I do that, I want to make two more points here, and then we're going to move into the thought. All right? Lorenzo Valla did two other things that were really quite interesting. 
he got a copy, you see, in the 15th century what was happening, they, everyone anticipated the fact that the last bastion of Greek civilization at Constantinople was about to crumble. The Turks or the Islamics had been trying to conquer that small little area that was still left of the classical age and they were not able to but the overwhelming forces were uh, imposing itself upon them for a final attack and therefore the Greeks living at that time they put on boats the best of their scriptures the best of their writings their philosophical writings mathematical writings their medicine all of that literature and they put them on boats and sent them to that great city called Florence and started Plato's Academy once more called the Chinos Plato Academy. For the first time Europe got, for the first time Europe got Europe, Latin speaking Europe. They never had it before. They never had Plato before. They never had Plotinus, Proclus, any of this stuff. They had a couple of bastard translations as they call them of Plato's dialogue, the Phaedo, a very poor one of the Timaeus. So from 1495 on, Ficino and his school at Florence started a vast translation program and they turned out work after work translated into Latin and therefore the first time Europeans Latin speaking or a Latin based uh, people got into classical thought they didn't have it before it started then. Valla studied there right? Valla studied Greek that was the thing to get into because they had been walking around ruins for years and couldn't couldn't duplicate even the ruins. Now the thought came but now the thought came into Europe and it woke up Europe and that was called the Renaissance, which is a misnomer so they, they, never, they never had a birth before, so they couldn't have a rebirth. That's what Renaissance means. Now, you know what's interesting now, you see, is when this literature came in, they also brought with them early Greek Bibles. Now the Bible was written in Greek, Old and New Testament, right? Hebrew Bible, what was not intelligible to the vast number of Jews, they all spoke Greek, they didn't speak Hebrew. Hebrew was already a dead language in the second century BC. Therefore they translated the Septuagint into Greek that early. The New Testament is in Greek. The Latin world, Europe, the Latin world, only had a Latin translation of the Bible called the Vulgate, sometimes called St. Jerome's translation. Lorenzo Valla got a copy of this Greek text and he wrote his friend Erasmus and said, we're facing a great crisis. I just compared the Latin, our Bible, the Latin Vulgate edition with the Greek edition, and I'm a t I have to tell you something terrible, he said. There's so many differences between the two that we're facing a crisis of the faith. This shocked them so much that they did not publish the findings. They just sent it around in letters to all of the major Renaissance thinkers. So slowly the word got out. Now, Rensifala did one more thing and I'd like to add that to the drama. <clears throat> now, uh, you may be able to draw a better map than I because I always, for some curious reason, end up drawing Greece much more bigger and all that than other countries and I don't know why I do that, but all right. All right. Now look here. The Roman Empire was divided into two parts, the Latin speaking, the Greek speaking, because it was so unmanageable. That's the way they broke it up in the third century. When Emperor Constantine became emperor of Rome, he saw again and again from past history that the Europeans coming down here, <clears throat> what were the Europeans called in those days? Barbarians, right? They were the barbarians. They were sacking Rome again and again and again, and he looked at the area and he said, look here, this is an indefensible place. You can't defend it. Once you break through the Alps, there's no natural defense line. So he came up with a brilliant idea. He said, you know what we should do? We should move the capital of the, of the Roman Empire. That's the Black Sea, and over here is the Caspian Sea, right? 
He said, let's move the Roman Empire's capital from Rome to this little jutting land here. It's a peninsula because there's deep marshes along this side. It makes it absolutely impossible to be attacked by land. If we're attacked by sea in this way, it doesn't make any difference. We can get supplies this way. And this, of course, you know, is the Bosporus. And he said, anytime anyone tries to attack us this way, we can just con construct a link chain across that, and no ships will be able to attack us. So therefore, it was virtually impregnable. They built a great city, Constantinople. Oh, by the way, when Emperor Constantine left, he had to leave someone in charge. So he made up this beautiful document which, by the way, the church rolled out for many, many years uh, during public demonstrations. And it's called the Donation of Constantine. In it, you see when Emperor Constantine left, he turned to the Church of Rome and he said, I am going to create a pope. And I'm going to bequeath to him all of the powers necessary to manage all of the lands to the west of that line. We will maintain to the east. In this beautiful document, he said, therefore, I bequeath not only the right of the Pope to be the final arbitrator of all affairs, both legal and ecclesiastical, but I give him the right to raise taxes, hold armies, hold lands, be responsible, therefore, for the coronations of kings. Before that, it didn't exist. And therefore, he has the absolute right over this entire area. And that started the Great War in Europe for hundreds and hundreds of years, called the battle between the church and state. This document. Oh, what does this have to do with Lorenzo Valla? <laughs> he took a look at it, and he said, gentlemen, I want to make a small point about this after looking at it. Uh, it's a forgery. It could not have been uh, made before around 18, about 850. It was never written at the time of Constantine. That was 300 AD. The whole thing's a forgery. So he did three things. Therefore, a short while later, a young chap by the name of Luther came along and said, let's see, the Bible is gone. We have the Greek text. We need a new Bible. Wait a minute, why do we have to hold on and believe in the Pope and his offices and his councils? They're based upon this document. Therefore, there's no legal right to hold us and bind us to the Church of Rome. That's gone. Metaphysics. What do we have to worry about metaphysics for? It was designed by a pagan, Dionysius. So therefore, he redefined Christian faith based upon conscience, didn't he? One man did it, Lorenzo Valla. Pardon? I can hear. Based on Luther. Based upon Luther? I hope. Pardon? Conscience. Conscience. Oh, conscience? Yes, conscience. Oh, conscience. Conscience. Then. Conscience. <laughs> right? Every man has his conscience. That's a sufficient basis to guide your spiritual life. You don't need the ecclesiastical. You don't need the hierarchy. You don't need the church. You don't need the sacraments. You don't need the paraphernalia of Rome. Do you not? Yeah. So therefore, Dionysius' name was changed to Pseudo. Right? Pseudo Dionysius. Pardon me? Yeah, yeah, that's where he got his name, Pseudo Dionysius. Now, so I told you I'd get back into the history. All right, yes, please. Yes, false Dionysius. Dionysius was actually who? No one knows who wrote it. But oh. it was written, it looks like, a year after they closed Plato's Academy and it was found in Syria where it happens just by accident, the philosophers went. Now some of you, I suspect, are thinking that maybe one of those crazy Platonists whipped up the letters of Dionysius and the writings of Dionysius to preserve and continue the Platonic tradition in the church. Is that right? Well, all you have to do, all we have to do is see to what degree can we say that this thought that we represented here is in Dionysius. If it is, how did he do it?
Right. Now, I thought you'd like that historical introduction. And now I'd like to tell you about the ten letters. All right, ten letters. I gave you a sheet, ten letters. Now, if you have time someday to get a good book and you want to get into this in some detail, I strongly recommend you get the book, The Hierarchy and the Definition of Order in the Letters of Pseudo Dionysius by Hathaway. You're going to have to repeat that. Well, it's there on the bottom of the page. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I do. Didn't you get one? Excuse me. I beg your pardon. Yeah, let me make sure you got that. It's also good for a Christmas gift. It uh, makes good Christmas cards if you fold them over. Right. Give it to the right person. Yes, yes, it's a good gift. I think so. I don't know. Even though it's a joke, it's quite serious. Now, what I'm going to do now is summarize some of the points that Hathaway has made. Right, he's a very fine scholar. He plays the violin beautifully, by the way. Right. And he makes the following points, and he can show why it is that they are the way they are. And it's not part of my thesis that I'm going to present to you. Therefore, I'm just going to summarize them so I can do what I want to do. All right, first thing he says. These ten letters bear a very close relationship to Parmenides. If you take Parmenides, Plato's Parmenides, and he has what are called the nine hypotheses. All right? And guess what they are? The first, second, third, fourth, fifth, the first is called the one. The second has been given the name intelligence, being, etc. Soul, body and soul. And matter, or unformed, non-living, right? Two, three, four, five. And then, there's the denial of these. The denial of the second, the denial of the third, the denial of the fourth, the denial of the fifth. That is to say, he whips out a great metaphysics where he shows you can understand the nature of the one. He gives you the logic and the tools necessary to understand intellectually intelligence, the soul, body and soul, matter. And then these are the arguments against it, which, the, which is a rejection of each of those points in the sequence that I just made. So, one is pure, stands alone. Two, you can actually, if you'd like to see it in a figure, I think of it in a figure and I'd like to share that with you. Stay there. You can put the second, third, fourth and fifth hypothesis, which represents each one of those, and their denial therefore you can study both how to affirm it and how to deny it, how to affirm it, how to deny it. Then you can see the relationships going any number of ways you want. It's extremely well organized. And each one of these can be re represented in this uh, great structure. Now Plotinus comes along, the great Neoplatonist, and he spends all his time trying to explain how you can make the transition between each one of these realms. And he does it with great, great uh, clarity and beauty, and that's called the Aeneids. These, as we said a moment ago, are hierarchically arranged. 
there's a hierarchical order. Um, Proclus does the astonishing. Proclus is the only, by the way, he's the only systematic thinker in the history of Europe, and he's never studied. No one studies him. Proclus is totally amazing. Totally amazing. He develops a rational system that makes clear every idea that's built by Plato and Plotinus, and he puts it in a beautiful intellectual system called the elements of theology. That's what he calls it, the elements of theology. And I footnoted that for you at the bottom of the page. Now, if you were to get the book, if you were to get the book, Proclus's Elements of Theology. And do you see those numbers, the propositions, 2, 23, 27, 28, 40, 64, 65, 100, 103, right, 148, 151, right, 185, 103, uh, two, no, 200, 203, right? If you just studied those, you could then go back into Pseudo-Dionysius and you could go line by line and you can say, ah, ah, restatement, restatement, quote, restatement, quote. But with this first, let's go back, all right? Now, how does the letters represent this? According to Hathaway, and he does a beautiful job, he says, you can take the first letter, you can put the letters right along here. <laughs> Pseudo-Dionysius took Plato's metaphysics. Dionysius took the Parmenides, this vast structure, and he represents each one of these great hypotheses, as they're called, by addressing a letter to four monks uh, you know what he does? Then a minister and then a priest and then a bishop, and then another one to a general bishop over the entire area. So you have five, six, seven, eight, nine, and the tenth one, which is special. Now Dionysius is going to do one basic thing over and over again in these ten letters. He's going to try to demonstrate to presumably the person to whom he sent the letter. He's going to try to demonstrate that in order to bring around a natural justice in the church and in its functioning, you have to have these people arranged in a hierarchical order. So he develops a very interesting way of reasoning to show that this is, in fact, a hierarchical order. And by the way, each time he develops one of these, guess what? It's one of the major ideas that represent this hierarchical order. That's right. So he, you see, by arguing for the church necessarily having this hierarchy, the need for it, the arguments he uses <laughs> comes, from, comes from Proclus's need to say that these principles are hierarchical. He transfers the reasoning from his metaphysical system that justifies the hierarchy, the very same reasons, the very same arguments he uses in each one of these letters. That's right. And Plato's Republic. First one starts with Plato's Republic. So yes, you can also take the first, the third, the fifth, the seventh, the ninth letters and put them parallel with Plato's Republic. That's another way of doing it. That's true. You can do that too. Yeah. So the guy's immensely clever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but wait a minute. 
There's something missing here. And this is called the problem. And that's what I wanted to talk about a little bit tonight, the problem. Why does Pseudo-Dionysius, or Dionysius, why does he bring in a monk? And he breaks the whole order. I mean, he's violating the hierarchical order. This is very strange. I mean, what's he doing it for? Very sad to see. Unless he's doing something interesting. Unless he's doing something interesting. Well, is this, the, is this the order? Yes or no? One, two, three, four. And the last one, by the way, is addressed to John, the apostle, the evangelist. Does that look like a hierarchy? Does it? Monk, minister, priest, bishop, and then back to monk? Is that what you're saying? No. Monk? Yeah, well, look here. Just do, follow me. Four monks. There are four grades of monks, by the way. Minister, priest, bishop, Countrywide Bishop, John the Apostle, the Apostle Evangelist. Does that look a, like a hierarchy? Yeah. Yeah, except for one thing. What's in here? A monk. Yeah, it's out of whack. It's out of whack. That's a problem. Doesn't fit. The eighth is a monk. Something's wrong. Agree? Doesn't fit. Therefore, all the speculation on, on Pseudo-Dionysius then is, what is the significance? What is he doing? What is he doing in the eighth letter? Therefore, I brought along the eighth letter. I thought I'd read you parts of it and see whether we can then have a little fun with it. All right. Eighth letter is the monk. What did I put in the wrong one? Yeah, oh, excuse me, that's a... Tenth is uh, John, the Apostle. Now, the uh, just while I'm getting the material out, please look at the note on uh, uh, the ninth. Symbolic theology. He has developed in the ninth letter how to understand all the some how to take the whole Bible, how to take the Bible, pull out all of its major terms that describe God. He shows you how you can understand each one of them analogically, so you don't take it literally. And therefore he can then bring intellectual order into the whole thing and escape anthropomorphism. He can escape all of the consequences of taking scriptures literally. Because one of the things that Dionysius did, which is really very creative, so if I can give you one more name here, Philo from Alexandria or Philo the Jew. <clears throat> now, if you want a good book to look into this, I would recommend this book, um, Hellenism and Judaism. by Hangel. It's a two-volume two work. Beautiful piece of work. He studies Hellenism in the Holy Lands, talks about it, has great sources, brings it together, but, all right, take that as a background. Let's go back to Philo. Philo was a Jewish philosopher, and he saw that the Old Testament is anthropomorphic, and it allowed a certain kind of identi identification with Judaism, and that identification didn't allow them to be more cosmopolitan. At this time, by the way, there are more Jews living in Alexandria than they were in the Holy Land. Right, they had been spreading around throughout the Mediterranean. And therefore, he began speculating on the following thought. He said, <clears throat> 
How is it that the Greeks are able to keep Homer, with all the anthropomorphisms, with all that strange uh, behavior of the gods, how can they keep their, their theology, their mythology, while still being rational? How did the culture develop an entire intellectual system with intellectual values of the highest degree and have a religion based upon Homer? based upon a crude mythology. So what he did is he started reading all of the people who were commenting on Homer, and he found the allegorical method. He said, that's what the Greeks have done. They have, through the use of analogy and using the, ana the uh, allegorical method, he changed it into an allegory. He said, I know how to deal with it now. I will do with the Jewish Bible exactly what the Greeks did with Homer. Set up a structure of analogies, treat it as an allegory, and therefore we can be just like the Jews, upon we will be just like the Greeks, we'll allegorize the whole thing, and therefore show it as an intellectual direction, and we don't have to take it literally, and we can free ourselves from all the anthropomorphisms, and that's what he did in six volumes. Dionysius did the same thing, see, he went to the Old Testament and the New Testament. He pulled out all of the terms, and he did what Philo the Jew did, only he did it on the New Testament as well as the Old Testament. And when you read that, the key for doing that, the key for doing it is only in 10 pages. And that's letter number nine called Symbolic Theology. Today that's called hermeneutics, a hermeneutic principle that allows you to understand how to take those terms and understand them in non-literal terms and how to do it. So that's the ninth letter. Very beautiful letter.